Well, good morning and uh, thank you for coming along and uh, thank you to all those who are, uh, and welcome to all those who are watching on the SERA uh, stream broadcast. Uh, I announced on February 10th uh, that we were in the final stretch of considering land that had been designated as uh, orange and needing further consideration uh, as to its suitability for residential occupation. Um, and on that day we rezoned uh, 255 properties in Avonside, Burwood, Dellington and Wainoni. Today I'm uh, announcing the rezoning of 252 residential properties in Central City East, uh, Richmond South and Linwood North. After uh, I think very, very careful consideration, uh, all but one of these 252 properties is being zoned red. It's never an easy decision to uh, make properties uh, uh, red, um, but uh, there is a consideration process that uh, is fairly exhaustive and as I've said, the further we get into these decisions uh, towards the end, they become much more difficult. So today we have 78 properties in Central City East, 29 properties in Linwood North and 144 properties in Richmond South uh, that are being zoned red. If you look at the screen behind me, you can see areas uh, where those houses are located. If you look at the screen behind me, you can see that there's one uh, larger area down in here that was orange that's gone uh, green, and that's um, uh, stayed uh, returned green because if you go down Bangor Street, you can see very clearly uh, where the um, uh, damage line occurs. Um, that property is considered to be much more like, in fact, very similar, uh, totally similar to others in the area that have currently gone green. Um, if you drive along Bangor Street, you'll see that uh, pretty clearly. Um, and you know the engineers have advised that ground conditions there are suitable for rebuild. Today's decision, I think, has been particularly um, vexing as all the final classifications uh, come together. Uh, I think I would describe them as exhaustive uh, consideration has been given to the question about the viability of remediating land in these areas and then of course rebuilding on it. But in the end the case for continued occupation uh, in the near future just doesn't stack up. We've concluded that an engineering solution to remediate the land and replace the seriously damaged infrastructure in these areas uh, would be uncertain, disruptive, take a very long time and would not be cost effective. So I want to stress it's like all the other areas that we've dealt with, uh, there are always possible solutions but those solutions often uh, will take a long time, uh, have uncertain cost um, and uh, would mean incredible disruption to the people who are in those areas. Uh, in all the areas zoned red today, there's been widespread liquefaction resulting in ground settlement as well as extensive lateral spreading uh, towards the Avon River. And as you can see, most of the uh, houses at the, on the boundaries of the uh, uh, areas that are zoned red today are within a very short distance of the Avon River. Um, uh, our consulting engineers, Tom and Taylor, have had their work peer reviewed, but they have advised us that treatment required in these areas to address the risk of future lateral spread uh, would be necessary before any properties could be rebuilt. And part of the conundrum we face when coming to today's decision uh, was, you know, uh, how much of that perimeter treatment would require intrusion into private property. And in many cases you'd have to intrude by uh, enough metres or enough meterage uh, not only to get the work done but also to get all the gear and everything else in to mean that uh, some houses that have got um, you know, lesser damage than others would still have to be demolished in order to complete that work. We also advise that the work would um, cause uh, quite a high degree of vibration that may lead to further damage in some other properties. And on that basis we've decided that the only feasible uh, option is to provide residents in these areas with the certainty that comes with the red zone classification of homes. And I know that um, as with all previous zoning decisions, uh, this will cause some distress for some people. Uh, I would ask people to think about what might be best in the long run for them uh, and accept that this is a point where they can make uh, firm decisions about their future. Uh, I think it will also come to a relief, as a relief for some others, and um, that has been the case consistently as we've made these decisions. Um, the, uh, today's announcement does not bring any relief to the 
uh, 401 properties that remain orange on South Shore West. And I want to spend some time uh, just explaining why. South Shore West was uh, um, subject to very substantial lateral uh, liquefaction and lateral spreading in February 22nd earthquake. In some places the uh, lateral spread was up to a, a metre wide. Rebuilding South Shore West then uh, uh, would require um, that lateral spread being addressed or the, the containment of lateral spread being addressed and engineers uh, have been and continue uh, to look at uh, what sort of solutions might be applicable uh, in this part of Christchurch. Those solutions um, uh, could be a range of things, could be a perimeter wall, maybe some foundation treatments and I've asked DBH some time ago uh, to advise us on what sort of foundations might be required uh, in this particular area. Some of the solutions that DBH uh, have been working on uh, have been developed as a result of the seismic testing uh, that occurred in uh, Parklands, uh, sorry, in QE2 Park, um, uh, some uh, starting last November and December. Can we just flick that slide? Thanks. Um, those trials essentially were looking at recreating uh, liquefiable circumstances. You can see the explosions have liquefied the land, and then testing what happens to the various structures. Uh, that they had put in place uh, around those particular explosions. Um, that work we would expect uh, to have uh, concluded very, very shortly. I'm expecting a report on uh, all of that uh, in the next month and uh, that, will, that will form the basis for a lot of uh, work, that, a lot of guidance for TC3 areas but will also give us a better understanding of the situation that exists on South Shore West. Just want to make a few comments about the Port Hills White Zone because there are still a large number of homes up there uh, we're in the Port Hills area who are waiting for our decisions. We've had uh, a number of meetings now with um, uh, all of the parties who are working on this, so Sarah, EQC, uh, their engineers of course, and um, the Port Hills Working Group as a separate group and the Christchurch City Council. And what I would have to say is that there is a huge effort that is very collaborative going into uh, the considerations that are necessary for good decisions around uh, homes who are the, in, in these white areas. I've asked that we can stick on track for a decision for all of that area by June, end of June, uh, and uh, I'm informed uh, reliably, I hope, by all parties to it that the timeline that's in place will get us to that decision. We're also hopeful uh, and believe me, all of those parties to this decision uh, are hopeful that we can make some decisions and announcements uh, on a time scale that's uh, progressive over the next couple of months. A uh, quick word about Parklands East. Uh, Parklands East um, took a bit of a hit on the uh, 23rd of December and we said at the time that we would review uh, that area to see if it is still uh, meets the criteria for going green. Um, when I spoke about that in February, I had hoped that we would be at that decision point by the end of the month. I think this just points out that uh, you know, putting timelines in doesn't always work to people's best advantage uh, and it creates difficulties, certainly for me, when I put my uh, uh, stake in the ground in that regard. So um, what we have had is uh, officials from Sarah uh, working with the Parklands Action Group, geotechnical engineers, uh, EQC engineers um, and uh, the Christchurch City Council uh, in an effort to uh, see what can be done to, to move things forward there. Um, I'll get a final uh, set of advice on that uh, very, very shortly. Uh, so we'd hope that a decision on Parklands East uh, can be made as quickly as possible. But I do want to assure people that uh, it's just not on the long finger, it's not an abeyance, it's just a matter of bringing all of those technical expertise together in a place that allows us to make a, a, a good decision. Just want to make a comment about the short term rental accommodation in the city, it's been the subject of some discussion uh, over the past week and just to indicate that the government's long recognised that uh, the, there was a role to play in providing temporary accommodation for people who had to move out of their homes for whatever reason that related to the earthquake. We set up the Canterbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service uh, which is run by the Ministry of Social Development and the Department of Building and Housing to help people find temporary accommodation. 
Uh, we think we acted pretty quickly to provide temporary accommodation by building villages in Kaiapoi and Linwood. Uh, and those uh, uh, houses there, the, the accommodation there, uh, has seen a flow through of people who are having their work uh, completed on their houses. Um, I just make the comment that for many others, they will stay in their house while the work is being done, and that's uh, what is often the case when people have large alterations to their house. They're trying to accommodate uh, staying in the house while that work's done, and we're grateful to people who are able to do that. Um, however, um, uh, we are looking at uh, what the needs might be going forward as the uh, program that is being run through the PMO office reaches its peak in the latter half of this year. Um, they're heading towards 11,000 completed, but we know that they've got uh, very big numbers and we want them to get to, uh, to those, that position as quickly as possible. Uh, so, you know, the, the picture is that since April last year, the accommodation service has dealt with over 1,800 people who've made inquiries about what to do. They've housed over 300 people, or households I should say, uh, with a further 100 who've uh, put themselves uh, on a list uh, with a date where they are going to need uh, accommodation in the future. Uh, the team's always looked at the private rental market first um, and then as in that event to help to further 250 households into uh, private accommodation. Uh, the villages have also seen an average sort of occupancy of about 12 weeks um, and uh, they're working particularly well for red zone residents who have a short period of transition between the day they settle um, and the day that they pick up new accommodation, particularly where those houses are totally destroyed. Uh, feedback from living in those villages has been very positive. You'd have seen some of that in the Christchurch Press this week. Uh, but as the repair does ramp up, uh, we probably will need more accommodation. And so uh, we are looking at um, uh, establishing uh, more capacity. When we first set up those villages, we bought uh, a bigger inventory of, of uh, houses than or accommodation than we needed, so we've had some on standby. Uh, we're now looking at uh, those sort of uh, uh, those those uh, uh, accommodation units being placed uh, similar similar to the other ones. So I sort of alluded to that earlier in the week, but what I can uh, confirm formally today is that over the coming weeks we'll be rolling out a further 22 bedroom uh, unit com uh, units on the Rawiti Domain in New Brighton and potentially a further 43 units uh, on that site over the months ahead as need arises uh, in time for the predicted peak of the repair which comes later in the year. Planning of the temporary village on Rawiti Domain was done in 2011, consents are in place uh, and units have been held ready for deployment uh, pending the need uh, and we're now activating that. Uh, so what will happen is that by I would think uh, uh, maybe September of this year we'll have 123 uh, temporary accommodation units owned by the government available for people for short term use. But I do want to stress that while these are temporary units and they are tr uh, relocatable buildings, they nonetheless need to be set up with all the amenity that you'd expect in a suburban uh, environment. They have to have good road access, they have to have water, sewer, power, wastewater uh, and telecommunications and that uh, it means that the, we've got to have a proper process for putting them in place. Um, that's about all that I want to talk about this morning. Happy to take some questions, but I would also like to uh, just um, uh, once again congratulate all the people who have been engaged in the uh, building of the stadium at Addington. It should be a good day tomorrow when it's open uh, and a bit of a turning of a corner for what's possible here in Christchurch. Let's go briefly talk about the Cathedral Walkway. So we had another busy weekend last weekend. So we had something like 31,000 people go through the Cathedral Walkway. So that's a total of 180,000 people um, either did the Cathedral Walkway or took a bus ride through the CBD. Um, and I think some people will have noticed those aftershocks we had on Sunday morning caused further damage to the Cathedral as well. So for some people they went in on Saturday and on Sunday they saw further damage had occurred. Um, for those of you who like a video, um, Allison Video Land is, um, is back open again. Um, we've moved the cordon to get them um, to allow them to you know get their business up and going again. Um, and the C1 Coffee Shop is also going to open up in that building as well. And they actually asked us to keep the cordon up so they could actually um, do repairs in their building without actually having the, you know the public wandering by, wandering in. So it's generally what we're seeing. We had actually you know we talked a lot about getting the cordon open by Easter. And that isn't going to be the case. 
in general what we're finding is business owners prefer the cordon up so they can make repairs to their to their to their properties without um, the public being able to park outside, you know, bang on the door and all that sort of stuff. Um, where particular building owners want to get open, we'll work with them to the best of our ability to try and, um, and reduce the cordon. Um, I think we're still looking at the, um, the gymnasium, which is Les Mills. Les Mills are still looking at opening at the end of this month. So that's another business which we're trying to work with them to try and make sure the cordon gets open so they can open up as well. The last thing I was just going to touch on was the heritage demolitions. Um, I know Warwick has talked quite a lot about this, but um, I just want to reiterate that we actually can only use our special powers, and we only use our special powers, where, where a building has been um, seriously damaged um, to the point beyond repair or is dangerous. In some cases, people have come to us with a heritage building they've wanted to pull down, and we've declined their, you know, we've declined their request for us to work with them, and we've said, no, you need to go off and go through the normal process, which is going off and getting a resource consent and a building consent to complete that work. Um, for a lot of building owners, it's not easy. Um, the costs of doing those repairs are expensive, um, but we work with them where we can. But there are some buildings where we are turning them down and saying, no, I'm sorry, we can't help you. We think your building is actually repairable. Um, we're keen to get this, the CBD when it does open up it again, the people do actually feel safe in there and they don't feel there aren't a bunch of old buildings that they feel fearful that are going to fall on them if there are further aftershocks. Um, and I think the work that's going on around some heritage buildings, I think the provincial chambers is an example of that where they're pulling it down pretty much block by block to save it to the great best extent they can. We're working closely with those sorts of organisations. And that's all I have for you today.